Hello and welcome to this. This is episode six, Russell Jones. Episode six. <laughs> episode six of the Two Russells Property Pulse podcast. Um, we've had some brilliant guests actually, but they are going to continue to get better and better and better. Um, and no more so than with the guest that we're about to introduce. Very excited the for this one. one and yeah. only, the infamous, the controversial, if I might say, Tyron Ash. Yeah. Welcome, mate. Hello, hello. Yeah, thank you for having me, guys. It doesn't look like you're in the West End of London uh, in with a rainy backdrop. It doesn't look like you're in England, mate. Where are you? Yeah, so I'm in um, the Address uh, Hotel in downtown in Dubai. Um, so just had a couple of meetings here and I've just been uh, doing a bit of work from here, yeah. So, but you live in Dubai now, yeah? I do, I do. Um, I moved here permanently about 12 months ago. Um and that was kind of um, part of really what was the business expansion. Um, and yeah, and now I'm here. So because so so, uh, on your website, you've got your London headquarters and you've got your Dubai headquarters. Obviously, the, the, the burning question, or in fact, we've got a few burning questions, yes. uh, as I'm sure you can appreciate. <laughs> why are you in Dubai? I mean, what's the reason for the yeah. move? Yeah, I mean, like, um, contrary to, um, I think I've heard some stories about um, Are you on the money run? laundering, yeah. Are you on the run? evading, being on the run. <laughs> um, unfortunately, I hate to, I hate to um, poo-poo any of those claims or to, um, you know, throw people um, off of what would be a great story. But um, no, it was just purely um, expansion. For me... Um, Dubai has been something where I was coming on holiday on holiday here like three to four times a year. Um, real estate gets rammed down your throat here. I was, um, you know, looking at how the brokerages were set up here, how real estate is done out here, and it become very appealing to me. My um, structure that I've built um, transitioned quite nicely over here, and it's been very, very easy to – I say easy. It's been challenging, but the – formalities of actually rolling it out in Dubai have been relatively trouble free touch wood and um, it's been going very very well so and, and and the market's better there right so is that the primary reason because the market in Dubai is a light lots and lots of expats buying lots of development lots of activity lots of liquidity I think isn't it the highest performing market in terms of value growth in the world right now absolutely um, you'd be you'd have to have had your head buried in the sand if you haven't seen what's going on here I think one of the misconceptions and certainly what I had to investigate myself was, is Dubai a like bubble? Um, when you actually get here and you see the infrastructure that's being built, it is not just, um, you know, a load of brokers coming over here trying to sell timeshares to people. What you've actually got is a government that has a huge plan to keep the world's attention and keep the world's wealth here. So, you know, of course, we had the um, previous, I say we, I observed the previous um, issues that happened with Dubai. There was obviously the famous scenes of people leaving cars at the airport and all that sort of stuff. Um, ever since then and after the pandemic, um, there has been an amazing um, resurgence of, as I said, infrastructure development, uh, communities being built. A lot of people are moving here for business reasons, investment reasons um family you know uh, for family reasons they want their kids going to private schools they want to earn more money through tax-free income they want to know that they're not gonna potentially be exposed to too much crime or any crime so there's a lot of benefits for people coming over here but for me it was um it was mainly the expansion you know just talking about story there Toro. so um Great to where you are now, but let's go back a little bit and, and your story, which um, I think is, yeah. is well documented um, uh, from that negotiator in Bletchley to where you are now. Um, <laughs> I, I, I heard you quote recently that when you were in prison, which we'll, we'll cover at some point, but uh, yep. it's known, um, you, you were at absolute rock bottom. Um, and when you're in hell, you get the best view of heaven and that, that visioning and direction that you've taken your life and your business, I really want to explore. So talk me through that, that moment when you thought this has just got to change and, and how you mm. mood board your life and vision your life. Yeah, I think it's um, a really good question because it's something that is, is sometimes difficult to articulate because when I look back at it, I see um, a lot of, 
a lot of points where I did hit rock bottom. It wasn't one singular point. There was um, the career point of view. I had that in the back of my mind. I was really worried that I always believed I had a lot of potential and a lot of aspirations and I could never achieve any of them. The, um, that was always in the back of my mind. My dad convinced me to be an electrician. He said that being a kind of salesman is never going to earn proper money. You need to get a trade under your belt. He'd already sort of convinced my brother to be a plumber at the time. So I guess he had plans for us to be like Mario and Luigi, if you like, and all his vital let properties. <laughs> but, um, you know, I spent some time um, doing electrical work. I got my qualifications and I was arguably the worst electrician ever in the, on the planet. Um, for me, it was about just being lost. And the strangest thing about going to prison and looking back on it was that when it happened to me, it was this weird relief. And I don't mean a relief of like happiness, but it was a relief of something's got to change because I was down a slippery slope. I didn't know when it was going to end. I didn't know where it was going to end or, you know, if I was going to end up God knows where doing God knows what. And it was just, um, a weird, weird point of my life. But in there, um, I really, really managed to gather my thoughts. I really, really went back to the drawing board. I wasn't a social person in prison. I wasn't somebody who was thriving on mixing with everybody. I was very private. I was reading a lot, reading a lot of books. Um, and I was just calming and educating my brain. I took up every course that I didn't have under my um, artillery. It was, it was, it was basic things like I didn't know how to formulate proper Excel spreadsheets. So I um, took an advanced Excel course there, completed that. Um, I didn't understand accountancy and business and how a business was set up. So I took their entry level business course. I did all little things that were just like brushing up things that I would never have ever done on the, on the outside. And, um, but the main thing was, was I reconfigured my brain into pushing myself to do the things that I don't want to do. Um, and that really was a day's hard work. I was lazy. I was always looking for shortcuts. And um, I re really had a good long look at myself for two years in the mirror. And I couldn't, I couldn't wait to, I didn't even know what I was going to do. I actually thought I was going to be an electrician, but um, I couldn't wait to go and ex exercise it once I was out. It was a, it was a, a testing time, but mainly mentally, mainly mentally. And I think that's what a lot of people are struggling with now. I'm not encouraging um, prison, maybe, but uh, the distraction that is around for everybody when they're thinking about their yes. next step in their career or where they go, if they go self-employed, they join you or one of the other guests that we've had on the show, mm. that they've got so much noise around. They cannot do that clear thinking. So when someone comes mm -hmm. to you now as a, as a young or whatever they may be, aspirational estate agent, how do you mentor them into that space? I think the main thing is, is that to achieve something that you've never achieved before, it does take a lot of discipline and it takes a lot of sacrifice. Because we live in a world where um, there are so many distractions, you just have to pick up your phone and you can get lost on TikTok or Instagram for hours and hours on end. Um, you can always get sucked into partying. You can always get sucked into the social circles. If you're bored, why not go to the pub three nights a week? It only costs you like, you know, if you've got a fine or whatever it might be. These are all kind of decisions that people have to consciously make in order to get themselves to where they want to go. So what we really stress is the mindset of what someone needs to be successful because real estate is one of those very, very cruel mistresses. And it's actually why I'm so attracted to the industry. It's because you are a direct product of what your mindset is, what your work rate is. You can't hide from your figures. You can't hide, you can't fake a sold post and you can't, um, or a sold board and you, although some try, and you can't, um, you know, you can't fabricate people's assets as, your results you can't do it it has to be fully effectively done and with that you can put that under your name and say i achieved that i did that and that is now something that has gone under my belt and i think that's why i love it and i think that i really really stress to people self-employed sounds brilliant you can do the numbers okay you can have five thousand ten thousand pound a deal or even more 
But what does it take on a road to get to you, get you to where you're earning 10, 20, 30, 40, even 50,000 pounds plus a month? Well, that takes years of sacrifice. That takes hard work because you've got to think to yourself, if a nine to fiver is doing, I don't know, eight hours, 10 hours a day, then you've really got to be working sort of 12, 14, 16 hours a day and often for no reward. And um, you've got to work for the result. You can't work for immediate gratification. And that is where people fail. Many people want the salary um, to tie them over and expect the huge results once they're ready to make the jump. And business just simply doesn't work like that. It does not work like that. And that's what we really stress to people. And when you, um, when you look at where you've got to here, it came out of frustration, wasn't it? So you're in North London dealing with wonderful homes, um, but you, 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 you couldn't spread your wings, so to speak. So your wings were being clipped. Tell us about that time. Yeah, I was. my social media was really exploding as I was in North London, selling around like Cockfosters, Hadleywood, Barnet, some beautiful, beautiful houses around there. Made a lot of friends and a lot of important clients there as well. Um, so for me, it was like I was getting messages from people that were in like Chelsea. They were in, I had some in Knightsbridge. I had some that were even further afield in Surrey. I was happy to travel an hour. I was happy to travel down and service the client. And the company, unfortunately, was sold on franchise territory. So like many estate agencies in the UK, when you uh, venture out of that jurisdiction, you have to pass that over to the office that manages that area for a small referral fee. Well, I, uh, you know, for me, I'm all about client ownership. I think that you service the client and you, know, you deal with whatever they're looking to do. Now, if it's that far away that you need to bring another agent in within the, the network, then that's your choice to make that decision. But it shouldn't be pushed upon you within that company that you can't do that. And that's what was happening. So after many kind of heavy conversations and being chased down by head office, I unfortunately had to make the decision to buy another avenue. So Ty Tyra, let, let's talk about that in terms of your corporate attempts, if you like. So famously, I, I heard a story that you went for several jobs within what we would call kind of top tier corporate central London estate agency businesses, Knight Frank in particular, um, and you got turned down. Um, as a consequence, do you think that has driven you to succeed, to kind of stick your fingers up at Knight Frank uh, and others potentially in terms of proving that you can succeed without them, given that they turned you down? So I guess the question is, have you got a chip on your shoulder, a Knight Frank chip? <laughs> I think that um, I certainly don't have a tip with regards to um, directly being kind of angry or driven against anyone or anything in particular. I think one of the things that um, I have got a tip on my shoulder about is I am a firm believer that, you know, if you are, if you have the effort levels, if you have the knowledge, if you have the credibility, if you have the work rate, you are good enough and you can be good enough. And I feel like there are some people that will not get the chances of other people. We've got people in the business who I know are going to earn 20, 30,000 pounds plus a month this month, even we're literally looking at the invoices that are going to be coming in, in this month ahead. And there are people who've come from absolutely nothing. And I mean, they're like living month to month um, from very poor areas, but they have learned and applied themselves so highly and there's an argument, I wouldn't put words in anyone's mouth, there's an argument to say, would these people get an interview at said corporate companies that are selling luxury properties? My question is, you know, I don't know. And for me, I just believe if you work hard enough, you're good enough. And I never got the chances. I sent multiple CVs out to two, two companies such as, as Knight Frank and other people, and they never got responded to. And maybe that, and that was obviously for the better long run, but that did make me want to prove a point, certainly in the short term when we launched the business. Yeah. Do, do you think they're snobs, Knight Frank and Savills? I think that they, if I'm being brutally honest, um, yes, actually, because I think that a lot of these companies, I wouldn't name any in particular, but what I will say is um, any, any person that, doesn't really kind of have that much to show for it, shouldn't be looking down their nose at anybody. And they shouldn't, just because you're selling a five million pound or a 10 million pound house doesn't mean that it's yours. And 
I feel like there. I, I mean, we were trying to um, do a few bits with some agents that were working for Sotheby's at the time, and the way this woman was talking, it was as if she owned the company herself, and you know, the property was hers. And I just thought to myself, there was a large sense of entitlement and a, a false pretense on how they speak about their role, the importance of what they seem to be doing, and. I didn't agree with it one one iota because I just thought, well, what have you done to, what have you done to have that sense of, of um, of arrogance? Well, almost, um, so when we've got people is, in our business earning, you're, you're talking about property sorry? elites. I mean, almost those that instead of capability are hiding behind the shop front of a big corporate. Um, look, I, I, yeah, 100%. Look, I, and Tyra, it has to be said that, obviously, as I said in the intro, you're, you're quite a controversial character. Uh, you know, you do definitely rub people up the wrong way. Um, and, and I say that as somebody that also does exactly the same, by the way, and takes great <laughs> pleasure in it. Um, I, 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 and I also, though, have a great respect for you, actually. I, I wrote a piece for Property Industry Eye a few months ago now where I kind of started off doing what everybody expected me to do in that piece, which is to start yes. a piece that looked as though it was going to start to assassinate you a little bit. But obviously what that piece was really about was my admiration for you and frankly anybody else that has the, the, the guts and the risk appetite to go on their own, which you have certainly done and you're encouraging yes. other people to do that. Um, so I think anyone that does that should be applauded, whether they succeed or not. Um, but it brings mm -hmm. me to something that's on your website where you, you talk about Tyrone Ash as a business being the future of real estate. What do you mean? What do you mean by that? I think um, for me, we are positioned in a niche. Um, the reason being is I see we are obviously in competition with, I think we're in competition with two types of agencies. So we're in competition with the likes of Knight Frank, Savills, um, these type of Sotheby's, these types of corporate agencies, because we're listing and selling um, the same types of properties. But then we're also in competition with other self-employed models. So um, the likes of Keller Williams, EXP, there's a few others um, that, are, that, that, that we're very aware of. Um, but where I believe we revolutionize it is that we position ourselves where we our average sale price is 1.5 million. The average sale price of a lot of these other self-employed agencies is very, very low. Um, we train agents to do the full 360 degree cycle. They're not just coming in and listing easy properties. They are dealing with millionaires and potentially billionaires sometimes and listing high profile properties, making huge connections. And they're earning a lot of money. Um, I, I I believe we are a very prestigious brand in the self-employed um, in the self-employed sector of real estate, and but whether people like it or not, we are there. And I am not here to be to be making friends with these people. I think that, quite frankly, um, everyone's got their own route. Everyone's got their own niche. Everyone's got their own angle. Now we're finding there's a lot more, in, you know, imitators coming to the market. Because I think, oh, that's an easy an easy way to run a business. We'll get everybody on no salary. Whatever they sell, they get paid on. And then we'll just run it as ours. But what they don't realize is that there's a lot of functional running costs with expansion. Not everybody is cut out to be a business owner or an entrepreneur. Some people will make more money being a top end real estate agent where they only have to deal with the front end that is listing and selling the properties that is potentially growing a team and that is building reputation and then consistently growing and expanding that way. Somebody else might understand finance, accountancy, business, all the, uh, all, all the, the troubles and the, the back office. and the stresses that come with that. Yeah. And you know, and they're better set doing that. I believe I'm I'm great at both, and that's why I've said very very openly in some of our company events that I know that I'm very outspoken with what's required and what we're doing as a business. But that's because I know that if you all revolted and left tomorrow, we'll still turn over a million quid because I'll go and do it myself. So as far as I'm concerned, I'd much rather learn off someone like that if I'm in this the the, the real estate industry than being told by a manager who's on like 25 or 30 grand a year or whatever, 
that I need to do this and I need to make this many calls by lunchtime or, you know, I go to a company that's offering me a ludicrous commission percentage but offers no real support on how you can actually list and sell those houses. Um, so for me, I believe that we are revolutionizing it. I believe our the training I provide in the business is absolutely second to none. We have live sessions where people can ask questions and actually implement them in real time. We have an abundance of training videos and structures. Plus we have senior support structures to make sure that people who are just entering the industry are shadowed by senior members of the start of staff. And then we've also very, very hell bent on attacking those properties that are listed by our competitors. We're aggressive door knockers. Sometimes people who, who do leave, because it's not all, you can't just say that it's, um, it's all roses all the time. There are some people that it's too much for them. They don't like door knocking. They think there's other ways of prospecting. There's other ways of doing things. And yes, you can win business other ways. But for me, I just think go to where the money is, go and put your services in front of somebody, show them why you're the best person for the job. And if you're doing that at a high level, you can achieve amazing things. It's it, it, For me, I'm half of our training is is real estate, but the other half is mindset. I'm, I'm, I'm building winners here. I want people who are winners. I don't like losers. I don't like excuse makers. And I don't like people who who really just faff around. Um, I think estate agency is full of them. Full of um, I think that there are too many people that hide behind absolute rubbish. And if you stick them out on their own, they fail, they sink. And that happens often. And we saw the company events on the uh, on the TV program. So, um, if you uh, that obviously <laughs> catapulted you into front or to millions of viewers uh, across the country. So, how was that experience? And uh, what what didn't we see that went on? Uh, I can tell you now there were there was some politics in the background because we were absolutely flavour of the month. Um, I was getting recognised absolutely everywhere, as were a lot of the team. Um, people really, really loved um, or had something to say. It didn't really matter, but it certainly got the attention of how aggressive and how direct the approach was. Um, the person who was the um, effectively the producer, I think they're called, they're the person who was in charge of the show itself mm -hmm. and it being televised. They were our biggest fan, um, but, it, but his contract was up and went to another television channel. And then we had someone who was certainly not my biggest fan who uh, who moved our third show, even though it was getting great views, moved our third show to, to midnight. And I thought, right, that's the end of that. <laughs> do you think, Tyrone, do you think, the it impact... stitched, do you think it was stitched up in the edit? Because some would say that it was designed to lampoon your business. A hundred percent. It was, if I, if they could archive, and if they could show what footage they had in the archives, it was not as harsh and not as raw as that. One of my biggest criticisms with it, with it was they made it too docky and they made it too raw. There was raw parts of it. I loved the scenes where like Quaz was shouting through the fence to someone like, oh, is your house to sell? And he's a bit rough around the edges at the time and all this. I loved all that. But there was scenes where we were sat in beautiful places in Chelsea having really, really nice... Um, classy experiences with each other, talking about the business, talking about family, showing a side to us that was humane. All of it was cut, absolutely every bit of it. It was a waste of time doing it. Yeah, I dragged any, my mum up the motorway for three hours. I dragged my mum up the motorway for three hours to film four different scenes all day, showing that she's got two boys that love her, that look after her, that pay for everything for her, that make sure she has a life where she hasn't got to worry about anything. Yeah. Where well, is if, that side show? If it's any consolation, Tony, there's there's a lot of the programmes, I think, that have been done. Uh, the one that was on Nest Seekers with Daniel McPeak, so I was talking to him last week, fun enough, about his TV experience, mm. which, again, mm. wasn't a brilliant one. Uh, I think you could say the same, mm. potentially, the Sotheby's episodes, uh, even Selling Sunset, you know, the American TV versions that a lot of this stuff is uh, is based upon. Yeah. Next, of course, We've coming Netflix, in May, yes. got Netflix and your mate Daniel Daggers, so he'll be on, uh, and it'll be interesting to see if he also is stitched up from the point of view that producers mm. like to caricature, particularly the property industry, and take mm. out, mm. as you're describing, the bad, or leave in the bad bits and take out the contextual good bits to actually show uh, the positive side of a particular industry. I think personally, I'd just like to comment on that. I think that, um, first of all, 
Um, I think Daniel Daggers absolutely deserves his own show. Um, I think that he, um, we've never actually spoken or, um, you know, even really conversed. He's coming on the I've podcast soon, a... Tyrone. He's on the podcast soon. Oh, great. Yeah. I've, I've, I've always um, respected what he did, what he did. It's not an area of the market. We've, we've hit some super prime properties, but I've never directed the business to try and crack the super prime market as such. It's more been prime. Um, but he is an expert at what he does. And whether, um, you know, I like the guy or not, I respect him. And um, I think he deserves to have his own television show. And I think if he's on Netflix and he's doing it, then, then you know, good for him. Um, that all encourages, people, the, to join the, uh, all encourages people to join the industry, doesn't it? And think, right, I want a slice of that, which is... And the self-employed element, particularly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. going to bring a pool of, of, of more more people. And that brings me to... Uh, we put a poll out there this morning, uh, Tyra, to see what people wanted to ask you. And a couple of questions that have come okay. up as... Um, uh, in your opinion, what do UK agents lack most when it comes to being really successful and self-employed? What what do they lack most? Yeah, I think there's a big lack of there's a big lack of risk taking. So everybody wants a safety net in the UK. That's the hardest thing. In Dubai, when we're recruiting people, they see even the UK people that come to Dubai, there seems to be this complete gung ho approach where they're like, don't worry, I'm just going to leave everything there and I'm going to shove all in and I don't care, I'm not going to stop till I've done it. And then we'll, I'm not saying everyone in the UK, but there seems to be this risk-averse mentality and that's who we sift through in the interview process. Funny enough, I had a, 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 a direction with the business where I thought, let's get to a 1,000 agents, let's try and be the biggest agency in the UK on size of brokers. And what was happening was we were recruiting like 30 a month and then we were getting rid of like 20 yeah. because they just weren't performing. And, you know, one thing that I always question with a business when it gets to like a thousand brokers or even more is I think to myself, are you a recruitment business or are you a real estate one? Because if they're charging people heavily on the joining fees, like thousand, two thousand pounds, then really that's their revenue stream. That's what they're after. And the more people they get in on a monthly fee is better for them. And if someone bills, then it's a bonus. For me, that's not how I work. I want people to be billing, to be building their own personal brand and their gro and growing in the industry. And um, UK agents, I've gone off tangent a little bit, but I think that UK agents just sometimes don't see the bigger picture or the potential agents. They're wedded to the um, They need to just base. understand. Yeah, and Tyra, I think people would like, as a consequence of what you just said, to ask for one of us to ask the question, how many agents have you got? So, yeah, we're at about 150 agents at the moment. Across and both locations or...? Uh, it's closer to 200 um, with Dubai. Dubai's at about 45. I've got to check the numbers. Okay. And you're saying that most of them are productive because of the way you've selected them? Absolutely. So we don't tolerate people who don't want to work, basically. I, I just think that they're very negative in any business. I'm sure we've all been there where you've got the person who's complaining about certain things and um, it spreads like wildfire. We just don't tolerate it. So we I don't mind if someone's not performing. We just don't want people not making the effort. Yeah. So, I know look, Russell's got other questions, but but for no, no, context. Just, yeah. So, Tyler, I have to ask you this, right? You're, you're a man that we've already said and everyone knows is larger than life, somewhat controversial. You're sitting there with what I'm guessing is about a thirty or forty thousand pound watch on. A lot of your well, are, promotional are I, stuff. Are I watches that much? Another one on the other hand, mate. Um, uh, that looks like <laughs> what is that? A gold yacht master or something? Yacht, ma yacht master two, yeah. What's that yeah. worth, mate? About 45, I think. 45 grand, okay. 45, okay. So 45 yeah, grand yeah, watch. Yeah. Lamborghini, living the life in Dubai. It all looks really flash. And, and I, get, I get that that is part of the persona. You're talking about having 200 agents that are productive. I mean... 50,000, 30,000 a month. Yeah, what we're talking about here, the impression that that gives purposely on, you know, absolutely as a contrived and engineered piece of PR, if you like, is that this is a huge and very successful business. I mean, is it? Do you make money? And if so, how much How much do you make, Tyrone Ash? Well, I think the question's always come up, and I won't go too much into it. But but, but, but people are very intrigued about you the know, reality of your success. Yeah. So there, there's the, the showman yeah. bit, which look, I applaud. I'm not saying it's a negative. Mm. How is that backed mm. up in reality? Yeah, I think um, for me, 
I um I live a very very good life. I have everything I desire. Um, I reinvest heavily. Um, so for me, I would if I get a hundred thousand pound in my hands, eighty ninety thousand pound of it's going back into investment. That's just how I how I operate. I believe that the reason we've expanded so well now, and we're coming into our biggest revenue year ever recorded already, um, is because of the reinvestment, the structures um, that cost a lot of money. It's cost me around, in the last 12 months, I've spent close to a million pounds just on restructuring the UK, expansion into Dubai, um, and all of the things that are attached to that. So for but me, your revenue must be tens liquid of millions. cash. It must be tens of millions, Ty. Yeah, I think I think we're I think we'll pretty, I think we'll turn over around five million this year. That's you as a brokerage, but I'm talking about what we would call GCI, so the gross commission that all of your agents are earning. Because so obviously you're taking what fifty percent, so the total amount that's being earned by your agents must be double that, right? So so you're million. a you're a ten million revenue business. Yeah, I, think, I think we're about somewhere in between. We're about seven. Which, from a standing start, what three years ago, isn't too shabby. Yeah, four years going into yeah fourth year now. Yeah, yeah, we're going to into our fourth year. And you're profitable, so, so it's not one too thing, bad. Profits another. You're, yeah. you're a you're a highly profitable business. Absolutely, I think that like the, you know, if if I'm honest, we've had years where we only just scraped over like first couple of years. It was like, I think year one we did like one point two, year two we did close to like just over to about two and a half yeah and then i think um last year we did a lot more so, uh, but i, I reinvested you, you, a hell of a lot that back if you could so hear, it's if you, you know, could hear the people watching this you'd hear lots and lots of keyboards right now yeah. where they're looking at company's, company's house, house. Yeah. yes yeah. trying to find your accounts yeah. i did that this morning you're a limited liability partnership rather than a limited company so you can't see your performance what why is that why hide it um it's very very simple i think that I don't really like how businesses are portrayed on companies' house. I think to myself, for example, you know, somebody can take, if, you, if you're working to just show a high net profit all the time, then you're actually costing yourself a lot more money in the expansion. It all depends how big you want to be. Like yeah, for me, I would I much rather be... But it confounds the critics, doesn't it? A, it does two things. A, it confounds the critics. So you get a partner at night, Frank, earning 500 grand a year thinking... My God, this guy that we didn't even grant an interview to is earning far, far more. Uh, go figure, as in that then becomes a recruitment tool. Um, but also, yeah, recruitment and the fact that you're showing credibility and plausibility for what you're doing. So surely you'd want to kind of shout that from the rooftops publicly. Well, for the first couple of years, not not particularly. There was, as I said, a hell of a lot of reinvestment. Um, and... For me, that was just what it was. It took growth. Um, our our supplier costs were like quadrupling every few months because it was just an expensive business to run. And if you expand that fast nationally, your CRM systems go through the roof. Your right move bill goes through the roof. Your your uh, Zoopla bill goes through the roof. Everything goes through the roof. Yeah. And then you start investing back into the marketing, social media. You obviously have to, you know, live a good life yourself and do what you want to do. And, you know, you can spend that money very, very fast. If I if I lived completely frugal and, you know, I was happy with the business kind of being stagnant, then we would be showing more net profit and less reinvestment. But I'll, like I said, I'll take an account to what I need to, to reinvest for the growth. I'm in it for the long haul. Like now that has all paid me dividends. So it's... You know, the head office is situated in Dubai. Um, that is where the company is run from. And that's where it will be run from for the foreseeable future. And, and the and UK what is, next? What's, is what's, just a, what is, is just a feeder into Dubai. What's next? What does the next three to five years look like then? I mean, do you sell it? Um, I am going to... If I'm honest, um, I don't think I would sell it, but I will be packaging it to sell. Um, the thing for me is that I know what's got what it costs for me to do that. I know what size it needs to be and how it needs to be run for it to have an extortionate value. Um, we run on a high net profit. I know what goes in and what goes out. And I know that a lot of businesses are running to sort of a 
10%, 12%, 15% profit, net profit. You know, we're comfortably running at sort of 35%. And that is margin, very, very right? attractive to, that is very, very attractive to a potential uh, investor. Um, but to get a scalable international business to that level, anyone who's got any business credibility knows that if you get a million pound, then you've got to put pretty much three quarters of that back in for the growth. You have to. It's it's business. You have to. I don't really give a shit what people look at companies' house and see. I know that I'm living a good life. I know the business is expanding. You can't keep expanding, you know, and and there be no money. You just can't. Yeah. So it's um it's impossible. It's it can't be it can't be a smokescreen for four years. It can't be. It can be a smoke screen for a year or two, not four. With um, we're gonna have to wrap up in a soon, Tyrone. Obviously, we've taken up a lot of your time, but a couple of questions yeah. before we do um, go. Uh, first one: um, where, where next? So, UK, Dubai, Spain, America. Where, where's uh, where's next? There'll be further expansion into the Middle East. I've got an eye on Saudi Arabia. Um, I've also been having a lot of talks on Egypt. So there's been a thirty-five billion dollar investment from the UAE into um, making Egypt an amazing um, attraction place. Um, so that is something that's on the radar. And then we're going to have some satellite locations um, where we'll have a, a smaller outfits in kind of Marbella, Ibiza, uh, potentially Mykonos as well. But that will happen probably within 12 months. Okay. Um, we have a phrase here that uh, to make your Mondays matter. So uh, making sure that everyone gets up on a Monday morning wanting to go to work or wanting to have a great week and ultimately have a great life. So what do you do to make uh, your Mondays matter other than that stepper? Well, he lives in Dubai. I think that's a good start. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think exercise has got to be part of it. I think people need to just get up and get moving, get the blood pumping around their body um and and do some do some difficult stuff get on the stairmaster go and do some boxing go and go for a run whatever it might be and just make sure that you're you know you're earning your breakfast basically and i think the other thing is is that people if they're worried about monday then they're in the wrong job very very simple yeah well said Right, look, I think that wraps it up. Look, Tyron Ash, thank you for being such a good sport and yeah. for agreeing to come on the Two Russells podcast. Um, Insightful. Look, look forward to bumping into you either if uh, you do venture back to the streets of London or indeed if maybe we come out to Dubai to do I, some podcasting. I'm in Abu Dhabi in October, so there you go. Maybe. Jet set. Oh, lovely. We'd love to catch up with you then, definitely. Nice Thanks one. for having me on, guys. No, pleasure. Thanks. Enjoy the rest of the sunshine. Uh, we hate you for it, but uh, thanks again. <laughs> Thanks. Cheers, Tyron. Pleasure, guys. Cheers, mate. Have a nice day. Take Cheers. Care. Cheers, Tyron. Thanks. Bye.